So welcome everyone. I'm Lisa Presley, one of the Congregational Life Consultants for the Mid-America Region, and this is our Wednesday edition of the March President's Webinar. Um, I'm recording this, and one of the things I'd love to ask your permission of is to be able to share this with the group wider than our community, to make it available to other presidents and congregations. So, um, you know, I'll try to remember to ask you that again at the end. Uh, there might I, I want to let you know so that you're not sharing things that you have uh, an issue with others knowing, but if you do at the end, we can just say, nope, this is just for the president's group. So I'm going to begin with a reading. It struck me that uh, a good book to look at right now is Poems to Live By in Uncertain Times, which came out after the September 11th attacks in this country. And this is one by well, one of my favorites by Wendell Berry called The Peace of Wild Things. When despair for the world grows in me and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water, and I feel above me the day-blind stars waiting for the, with their light. For a time, I race, rest in the grace of the world and am free. And so I want to welcome you all here today. Um, <clears throat> when I sent out the notice last Friday about, hey, we're going to talk about coronavirus and COVID-19 um, COVID, uh, disease, I thought, ah, you know, this isn't a big deal. Um, you know, it will be fine. And then time passed. And with only, you know, by the time I got to yesterday, we realized how much more serious this is and that it's not just going to simply pass by my wishing it to be so. I don't know if, um, first of all, I also want to say that I am not a medical person. I offer no medical advice or whatever, but I have a ton of resources to be able to share with you as you talk with your congregations about how you're going to deal with this situation. I don't know if you know, but on Monday, the UUA asked all of its employees to start working from home as quickly as possible. So for people like me who have always been at home uh, with work, <clears throat> it, it's no big difference, but it is a big difference for a lot of our people who work at the headquarters staff. And it even got me wondering, and I was able to confirm that we are doing the right thing about uh, whether or not employees who are hourly or work only in the building taking care of the building, whether or not they would be taken care of economically during this time when they can't get to their jobs to do the work. And, and of course, thankfully, the UUA has decided to do that. Um, and I'm hoping that many employers will, but not so sure. But anyway, I just wanted to be able to um, have a conversation with you today and then find out what some of your questions are and have us be able to, to, um, to think together through all of this kind of thing. I know uh, that already this morning, the Kentucky governor has asked all religious communities to stop holding services. So I see Deborah here who is from Kentucky and I don't know if any of our other states have already asked for that. But I think it's really an important thing for us to begin thinking about. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to click on the, I'm going to share some of the resources that I have and some of the ways I've been thinking about this. So I'm now just trying to, you know, find the appropriate documents. Um, so here's the appropriate document, but that's not where I wanted to start with that. So I'm going to go over here to this one. Um, one of the things and, and because I can't see you all when I'm sharing my screen, you know, feel free to jump in with your questions. But one of the, the things that you've probably been hearing a lot about, and this graph helped me understand and uh, decide to take a different kind of response than I might have otherwise, is how important social distancing is. One of the things that we know is that we have no idea how many people have come into contact with, with the, um, with the corona, the new coronavirus, uh, only some people are being tested, and only some 
uh, communities are willing to do that or have the tests available to do it. There used to be very particular criteria about who could and who could not get tested, but we don't know about, you know, all the people who may have come into contact without knowing. Um, and so the assumption I have is that almost anybody I meet on the street or sit next to in any situation could have come into contact with somebody who has been in contact with the virus. And so this whole thing about flattening um, is that the, the argument is to me cogently made about when we have uh, protective measures, when we're doing social distancing, when we're making sure to wash our hands and do all of those good things, what that does is it buys us time in a couple of different ways. One is that um, the, the passage of the, of the virus back and forth will diminish the, or, you know, it may not, it may end up, you'll see it in this chart on the blue, that with protective measures, it will probably last for a longer time, but it will be a lower curve. There will be fewer people at any particular time. So it won't be overtaxing our healthcare system. You know, if we get, if we don't practice preventative measures or protective measures, we will end up um, perhaps overwhelming what resources there are for respirators, other things like that. So this, um, I found this diagram very helpful. And then when I scrolled down through this particular report, and I'm going to be giving you, you know, oh, I actually have already sent out the links, but I can share them again. This document to me was very telling. It's from the source, the source is the Chinese Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And this is the mortality rate from the virus. So you'll see that for those up until age 50, it really is quite low. It starts to peak a little bit at 50, but when you look at the 60, 70, and 80-year-old population, the chance of, of um, having serious repercussions from the virus uh, escalates dramatically. And so for me, this is a really compelling argument because so many of our congregations are ones that have a very high age range in them. Um, there are some people who are saying, you know, well, it's really not that bad, et cetera, except the problem is we have no idea. There's so much that we don't know. And by using the protective measures, in my mind, it allows our scientists to be able to figure out things before we need it. We don't know how long it's, the virus survives on surfaces. We don't know how easy it is to transmit because again, we really have no idea what's happening with that. You know, take for example, the case of the, uh, the synagogue in New Rochelle, New York, if you've paid attention to that, that there is, you know, that one fellow uh, has been tested positive or te who attended something at his church, then went several other places. And now they have a quarantine area for one mile or a containment area for a mile because it's spread exponentially throughout that community just because one person came into contact with people. And so for me, this is why it becomes really important to make sure that we in our congregations are not just saying it can't happen here, but we're finding ways to be able to figure out how to protect our people. And, um, and so last night uh, on the on the webinar, you know, one of the things that uh, that I talked about was that, um, and if I can find that note, which I might not be able to do, you know, I talked about how um, for us there is the abundance of care which everybody is using, but there's also what do the ethics of our community call us? What does being beloved community mean? And so how do we find out how we are uh, responding to this? How can we best protect our people and make good decisions about that? Um, some of our staff may themselves be in the groups that are most seriously impacted by this. Others may or may not. So, um, so the question of what to do becomes a really important question. Uh, I'm also looking, you know, so, so the first thing to do is to make sure that you have good information um, available to you. And many of you probably have already gone on to, um, I'm just going to go back to sharing now and show some of these sites I have. Um, um, many of you probably have already gone 
to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And they have this whole big situation here uh, page where they have lots of information, both from the White House, but also from other sources. Um, and how do, you, how do you deal with this? They also have this great link here um, for community schools and faith-based organizations. So they have a check, they have how to, you know, how to prevent this at home, uh, all this kind of stuff, and where's the one I'm looking for? They also have a checklist or a section right for resources for community and faith-based leaders. So, you know, how do you clean and disinfect your space? What's the checklist that you need? And what's the interim guidance for, for this? And, um, you know, the main thing to do is to make sure that we are paying attention to what our communities are asking both locally and um, and statewide in this kind of thing. For example, I've gone on to the Michigan website because that's where I live and they have uh, a full set of information but they also have a link where I can sign up to have information come directly to me so I don't need to, to go out and seek it. And so part of this is really just figuring out, you know, how are you going to react and respond? Um, let, I'm just going to stop sharing for now and, and just, you know, so what are you doing in your congregations? Have you had this conversation yet? How is it, how is it coming about? What are your decisions that you're making? Hi, this is Martha. I don't know why my video isn't working, but I'm happy to be a part of this conversation regardless. Um, you can hear me, right? Yes, we can, Martha. Okay. Um, our congregation is really, uh, has been talking about this, although the staff have been doing it independently, and I am, uh, as board president, uh, trying to become more involved with what's going on. Uh, they were ahead of the curve for a while, and I'm insinuating myself in the conversation now. A lot of research, a lot of discussion, and um, I believe the staff is about to send something out to the whole congregation. And to my knowledge, it doesn't recommend canceling church or whatever. I have hopefully a, a conversation later this afternoon with um, our minister. But um, we just found out yesterday that there was a, there's a member of our 400 member congregation who is in the hospital and has tested positive. So uh, it's an elderly person and we are extra concerned because of that. I, am, I have a board meeting scheduled for next Thursday night and I'm changing it to a Zoom meeting. Um, I have sent out the, the, I've shared what you sent us, Lisa, about yes, last night's video with my board members so they can watch that. I found it very um, enlightening to, to see all that conversation uh, that you all had last night and I shared it with them and I will share also the resources that you talked about in that video and that you attached with my board members so they can uh, become an even more enlightened group of people on this topic. So I guess that's where I am right now, although I just, the reason I was a little bit late getting on is because I had a phone call from my vice president who was absolutely in tears because she is also a yoga teacher and holds a class at church of about six to eight people who show up every Wednesday morning and they're all elderly. And she was thinking she should cancel it, was advised by someone at church that that wasn't necessary and she held it anyway, feels bad about it. So I don't know what else to say about that, but I'll stop talking now and hear what others have to say. Well, well, thanks, Martha. And I really, you know, um, these are struggling hard decisions. I'll be sharing, you know, some of the other resources with you. But, you know, if a church closes for worship and you have renters, do they continue? Does the church actually close it down or not? How do you share information about um, 
about decontamination of areas, that whole th kind of thing. But it also might be that um, something like a Zoom call with um, uh, can still teach yoga, you know, that people can have their cameras on and position, you know, that kind of thing. And so one of the things you might want to consider doing if you're still holding in-person services is make sure that you have um, that you teach classes on how to connect in these other ways and help people learn how to do it so that those who can't easily do this have a way to make sure that they can be connected. So thanks, Martha. Anyone else? Robert, you need to uh, unmute. Robert, going next, I'll re remute. Okay. I well. One of you needs to unmute Jessica and we'll figure it out. Okay. Shall I go? Yes, go, Deborah. Um, so, uh, uh, our membership coordinator has really been um, conscientious about looking at all these resources and uh, has written a letter that was sent out to the congregation Monday, just two days ago. Uh, you know, talking about the kinds of steps that that we're, we've been taking at church. She has this membership coordinator has been going around wiping everything down. Um, uh, you know, at least once a day. Uh, she had hand sanitizer uh, that she gave to our greeters on Sunday. Um, she's really been on it, even though we don't have that many cases yet in Kentucky. But uh, who knows how many really. Um, I uh, shared with Lisa the the reaction of one of our member doctors who just felt like the whole thing was very overblown. Um, but the truth is we have very many older uh, members. You know, truly we're a congregation of 60s, 70s, and 80-year-olds. And so I think, as you say, Lisa, ethically, we really need to be taking this very seriously. Um, this morning at a 9 a.m. press conference, uh, our governor, as, as Lisa mentioned, has recommended that church services be canceled. And uh, the feeling of those I've been able to hear back from on our board is that, you know, if, if that's the recommendation of our governor, we can't, uh, we, we can't ignore that. Um, I mean, how awful if we held services and something happened, just, you know, that would be tragic. I mean, it would be tragic anyway, but um, uh, would not be the responsible thing to do. So I think we are canceling services for this Sunday, and then we need to think about what to do in, in you know, subsequent weeks. Reverend Kathy is um, trying to consider what she might do at 11 a.m. on Sunday that allows people to participate in some remote way. Uh, so I really appreciate, you know, she may just give a sermon that people can zoom into or, or whatever, I'm not sure. Um, the one other thing I want to mention is that uh, Alan, God save my, our vice president of the board, um, he just started rolling out with a whole bunch of stuff that I hadn't thought about and haven't seen in any of the um, recommendations thus far, although Lisa, I had given everything this morning, I have not had a chance to, to listen to last night's conversation. But he was suggesting things like, you know, our minister stands and greets people as they come out. Um, and two th things about that, one is she's either hugging or shaking hands with everybody, which then, you know, passes that right on down the row. And secondly, people are all bunched up very tightly together at that moment in time. Um, and so Alan was saying, you know, once services do get back, you know, let's say we hold them a week from now, uh, let's drop that, let have Kathy not even stand there to, to greet people and you know, make it clear why. And um, another thing is the, the door entry, you know, everybody is reaching for the same door. Uh, and so suggesting that our greeters stand on the other side of the door and actually be the one person to open the door. So those were two suggestions he made off the top of his head that I thought were excellent and, and things that I hadn't seen before. Thanks. And, um, you know, some of the suggestions that are coming up. So let me just switch to um, one of the uh, 
one of the possibilities that exists for your religious professionals in your congregation to be able to take advantage of is, um, again, to the share, um, is that there is now a Facebook group called UU Religious Professionals Response. And this is a site that ministers, religious educators, musicians all can go on to. And there are people posting lots of things. You know, one of the things that, um, that some of the suggestions are very similar to the kinds of things that your vice president mentioned, Deborah, in that um, don't have people handing out the orders of service, have them on a table where people can pick them up. Do not pass collection baskets, but have places at the back where people can put their envelopes in. You know, do not hold hands at the end of, uh, you know, during your service. Um, that if people, you know, and, and no shaking of hands and no hugging, that kind of thing. Because one of the things is we don't know who people go home to. So we don't know, even if you're uh, a 20 year old, you might be living with your grandma who has serious issues, uh, you know, and so that kind of thing. But this, this community is there and they're sharing a lot of files and a lot of information. <clears throat> so there's information about, you know, what hymns can be used um, when, you're, when you're doing, uh, when you're on, you know, when you're Zooming and that kind of thing. And so then um, let me just, uh, there are also a number of resources available. So I would recommend that you not cancel worship, but instead move it to an online platform. <clears throat> and on that list, there is um, Renee Rahatsky, who's one of my colleagues in the Central East region, is doing an amazing job of making sure that we have information that's up and available on how to do online services. And so, on, on this one here, it you know, talks about the copyright, know the limits of technology, all that kind of stuff. I'm gonna send out the resource page later after this call because I also learned about a new one that she has. Um, oh, sorry, that's, um, this is uh, there. Oh, come on, which is the right? There's so many, I have so many tabs open right now. Um, so I had to stop sharing in order to find. Um, um, but but that one you know talks about how do you deal with the offertory that kind of thing. There's also here we go. I've never one of the problems on on Zoom is that the bar um, where you stop sharing covers up half of the tabs. So um, so this one here is a great one. It's a guide to streaming Sunday services, meetings, and classes. So it talks how do you actually do this, and it talks you know how to plan a service. That's the one I just showed you but also how to stream and how, with technical tips on how to stream um, through Facebook Live and YouTube and how to hold meetings online. This will be, she keep is working on this all day long. So later today, there will be a section in here about how to use Zoom. One of the, one of the easiest ways to do it is from something like Facebook Live, but the additional, uh, but you only really can deal with one person one place. With Zoom, what you have the ability to do is to um, have multiple presenters in different locations. So you can have the a worship leader in one site and a preacher in another and someone who leads singing in a third. When you do lead, lead singing though, you wanna make sure that everyone is muted other than the person who is leading the songs because with the delay in technology, it will just sound absolutely horrible if other people are done. But so those are a variety of ways and you can also, um, you know, you can, you can uh, interrupt the regular kind of worship and do breakout rooms where you can have people talking in groups of three, four, five, whatever numbers you want, so that they can actually have a conversation during worship and have that more intimate connection that we get when we're in person. One of the things that was amazing was our congregation in Kirkland, Washington, who is, um, is right in the heart of the area where, um, where the, uh, the the well Kirkland Washington is where that that living care center the the nursing home had so many people who were infected um, and so they went to online worship last week and found that really important but um, uh, what the, they averaged ninety people a Sunday and they averaged eighty six people through the online Zoom 
So it's really very easy to do. There's also, um, I'll come back and get other people's comments in a moment, but some of these things are just really reminding me of some of these sites. One of the um, things that I love is that this congregation is doing a um, online ministry this week that includes bed family time and bedtime stories. So you can gather people that way. They're also having a midweek renewal service where the ministers will be there to, you know, sort of do a more quiet time. And then they have lunchtime conversations um, with this is how you use Zoom, you know, and that kind of thing. So there's, there's quite a lot of uh, cleverness that's coming out of this that will also, I think, serve us once the pandemic part of this is over, because we'll find ways that we can include people who can't be there otherwise on Sunday mornings. So Sue, I see you're on, uh, Sue Klein, I see you're um, unmuted. Did you want to share something? Um, only that we, um, I've been talking a lot with our minister about, uh, we are expecting to have a board retreat this Saturday. Um, on our church premises uh, with a special guest from Mid-America region, um, namely Reverend Dittmar, who has offered to do this um, remotely, and we could all do it remotely. I'm concerned about the impact of her presentation um, from remotely, not that she can't do it, but I don't think we'll take away as much. Um, and we've been talking about whether we should cancel ser or yeah cancel service this Sunday, leaving tomorrow to be our decision day. Um, and that's partly because we've heard that the Ohio governor may be closing schools. So, uh -huh. you know, we're taking a lead on that. So I, at this point, I am not in favor of canceling services or board retreats. Um, however, I'm one person and um, I think we're leaning towards actually canceling. And I know that we have uh, several Unitarian churches in Cincinnati and the ministers are conferring as well. So very aware. Um, I appreciate the resources you've sent. Um, our pastor knows how to upload to YouTube and we may use that as our uh, method of sharing. We have to make all those decisions. I'm at church today to make sure that we have connections for all those things. So, um, but that's what's going on here. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, and these are really tough decisions. Um, the UUA has canceled all in-person conferences in March. Uh, anything that they are doing. The Ministerial Fellowship Committee is meeting totally virtually for their deliberations. Uh, the Transitions Office is working to help congregations who are expecting to have either pre-candidating or candidating week uh, times when they're search for their minister, how do they morph that to a virtual realm? Because asking our ministers to get on airplanes and travel, uh, you know, is there, there is, I have canceled uh, several things in March. Um, there's one thing I may be doing this weekend, but instead of, I, I will be driving and I will be using my own car rather than a rental car because I have no idea who will have been in the rental car and how well they clean it, you know, so, but it's, but um, we're, we're trying to look at, you know, what can we do virtually because that is, um, that's safer for everyone to do. But yeah, and, it, and it's really tough. How do we, how do we do business as usual when it's not as usual? Robert, you tried to talk earlier, but you were muted then. Do you want to go now? Yeah, uh, I just wanted to say uh, we have a board meeting on uh, tomorrow night, <clears throat> and we um, we have pretty routinely been using Zoom for uh, our board meetings because uh, at least one of our members is out of the country on 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 those Thursdays. Um, the the change for for me is I'm going to go in in the morning and set up all the cables. We have to set up the cables separately when we do, we do the, the, the Zoom meeting. So I'll set up all the cables. I'm going to leave them in place so other meetings can, can also use that if, if they choose to. Uh, but we have not said everybody has to do that. In fact, mm -hmm. we had a, a board, uh, we had a, a book club, we had three book club meetings this, this week. 
and uh, they were all in in person. Um, we are doing uh, elbow bumps and and encouraging um, those kinds of of um, decreasing vectors, right? That's that's the infectious yeah. disease um, um, strategy. Um, I did find uh, we're doing our our uh, uh, stewardship gatherings, and I, I found on uh, uh, on uh, Sunday that uh, we were out of um, uh, hand soap in the kitchen, mm. and I said, "Oh, we got to fix that," and found a supply and and refurbished that. Um, but we we do. Uh, uh, regular terminal disinfection on, on all of those surfaces and the tables. Um, we're probably doing it more, should I say, it, religiously <laughs> um, than than usual now. Um, and I have uh, forwarded the the material from uh, last night's uh, video to the board members, so we'll have a little conversation. Um, instead of some of the other stuff that's on the agenda for tomorrow night. Thanks so much for that. And yeah, some, you know, it does take some extra work. Anyone else want to share what's happening in your community? Uh, this is Erica. I am. Um... This is all very helpful because we were just in the beginning of talking about how we're going to handle services and um, so it came kind of all of a sudden. Um, the one thing I'm um, interested in doing is sharing information about with our um, members and friends about what you need to do to stock up to be ready to close your doors and stay inside for a while. So I thought about that and so I got lots of frozen vegetables and fruits and canned stuff and, and rice and staples and things like that that I got several days ago. But I think that's a service that we owe our uh, community to share that information with them in case, you know, they need to lock down and stay out of public places. That's pretty much all I have to say. I'm getting lots of great ideas from the rest of you, but we haven't actually done anything yet about what we're going to do about services. We just talked about it, so we're going to make a decision pretty soon. Right, and you know, last weekend, I think there were only a handful of congregations who were considering closing uh, or shifting to online worship. And now, you know, as the, as the illness progresses or the, our knowledge of where it is, has progressed changes um, because you know uh, who knows uh, that we will that more and more congregations will be forced in the kind of decision as Deborah said where you know when the governor says thou shalt not you know do we use our anti-authoritarianism to say oh yes we will or you know one joke that was made at one point was well maybe we should tell our congregations they all have to have online services and then that anti-authoritarian thing will get them rebelling and can and doing online instead but um we we don't need to to do that anyone else want to talk about what's happening or the questions you might have too can I just share that I just saw a news uh, 122 p.m. Wall Street Journal headline that the World Health Organization has declared a pandemic. Yes, they did that earlier today. Mm -hmm. um, and so we will see what that does. Stacy, I see you're unmuted. Yeah, um, so also I'm really thankful because our um, staff were really ahead of this too. They already sent out some notifications and we did things differently during service. But my question, and we're you now talking, I think we're going to go ahead and cancel services. Um, tomorrow, we have several people who've tested positive around our area. And as many congregations, we have elderly people in our congregations. We want to be mindful of that. And a lot of people have said that they just don't think they'll stay home because they really want to come. So us maybe holding online might be a good way to encourage them not to come, make it easier for them. Um, but we do, you mentioned renters, so we do have a school that rents space in our facility, and I guess I just had questions about 
should we talk with them, encourage them to consider, you know, canceling classes? I, I just don't know how to proceed with that. Um, they use a different space than where we meet, but they do use the same space as our RE programs. So um, Robert asked where you are, and I know you're in Indianapolis, so I'll just supply that answer. Uh, great question. I would say you at least need to have a conversation with the renters and say, we are, you know, we're, we're in the process. We may end up holding only virtual online stuff. So how are you, um, what, what precautions are you taking? How are you decontaminating the area? How are you, you know, what is your thought process? What do you think, you know, and, and, um, and, and maybe have that conversation about whose job is it to decontaminate, um, you know, uh, and, and how do you, how do you provide the best for them um, without increasing your liability? So, you know, telling them what your decision is, how you are, why you are doing this, what you require from them as far as decontamination and keeping the safe, the space um, clean and, and that kind of thing would, could be a very important conversation to have with them. Um, also, one of the things that I would really encourage for, for any of you who are moving to online um, is that, that your professional or your staff still be reimbursed or still be paid their regular amounts. And it might be that their duties change. So the music director might not have a choir rehearsal, but hey, could they do a sing-along? Could they do a music appreciation night where they share, you know, again, virtually some of their favorite pieces of music and why? Um, you know, so how, how can you build community when you're not in the same space? The religious educator, that wonderful thing about having story time. You could even, you know, do uh, recruit different members of the congregation to read a story every night, that kind of thing. So there are ways to keep in touch with each other and and provide community, even though you're not meeting in your physical space. Um, so that's another another way of helping promote this kind of thing. But yes, I can't remember now who said, you know, who opens the doors, you know? So if your weather is nice enough, you might just wanna prop the friggin' door open. Um, you might wanna prop doors open to your restrooms. Things like that, so that um, so that there's less of that. Yes, you want the hand sanitizer if you're in person. You want, but soap is soap and water is better. So making sure, um, you know, I'm always intrigued by say restaurants that only have cold running water in bathrooms. You know, so how do you, you know, how do you deal with that? If you're looking at, you know, if you're still holding in-person services, I would say tell everyone to bring their own coffee. Um, and not risk that contamination unless you have a, 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 a system where, you know, if you're using real cups, they can, they are sanitized, not just washed, you know, so that you're ending up doing that. If you're serving snacks, switch to something that is individual servings, um, you know, pre-packaged rather than having people dig into a bowl that has something or, uh, you know, or, you know, some places have boxes of donuts. Well, if you pick a donut out, you're going to probably touch others, et cetera. So, so looking at all of those kinds of things about how can you make sure that people are not touching as closely can be really helpful. There's somebody else who doesn't want, what I can do is start sharing a few more of these possible, um, of these sites, just so you can see what, um, what there was. I had to get back to the right. I always takes a moment to find the right buttons to push. Um, and this is where I wish I, you know, had somebody else who was doing some of this technical stuff from time to time. Okay. Lisa, so um, can I ask a question before? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, I'm finding this, very, very helpful to share this across presidents and with your yes. facilitation. And I'm wondering, given the severity of the issue, if we could have some kind of, rather than waiting a month for the next one, maybe just a shorter check-in absolutely in a week or something something to think about. I'm not sure how to do that exactly, but um, yes, and yes. Um, 
Uh, and one of the things I might do is just, you know, we might have a couple of things where it's sort of an open house where anybody can drop in, not just presidents. And I'm mm -hmm. not sure if you were on early, Martha, when I talked about also sharing this recording beyond this group with people yes, yeah but um but we will be doing that the pacific west region has also had a couple of webinars that we're going to get the link to their recording and share those because they're the area you know they're washington state and california and those areas which have had seen the larger number of cases so far to date and so we can learn from them as well right and as things change yeah oh they're going to change right so um so here's a Zoom video tutorial. So on the Zoom website, if you're using Zoom, there's information here about how do you join a meeting? How do you schedule meetings? So you can share this kind of information with your members. Again, I have this on that list. So um, you don't have to be madly writing down what the links are. I also found this article by The Atlantic was very helpful yesterday about canceling everything and social distancing is the only way to stop the coronavirus. Um, and so this is, we do have people in our congregations, you know, as Deborah mentioned, a member of theirs, who think that this is not a problem or will not be a problem. And frankly, that comes from a privileged place uh, often because it's either somebody who's in good health um, or someone who might have access to, to health care. That's very good because anyone coming out of this, uh, this virus situation who doesn't have good health insurance may find themselves in a real bad place. So anyway, this article is another one and it helps people understand, um, helps convince our people a little bit more. Let's see, what else do I have? I've already shown you the flattening the curve one. Um, the Chronicle of Higher Education has published this thing. It's designed for educators, but there are great tips in it about how to go online in a hurry. Where do you start? And what are the kinds of things you need to think about um, as far as how do you engage people, which is different online. And, you know, as Sue was pointing out, the concern of will Sharon be able to be with them as well um, when when she's uh, virtual. And so there's, you know, it then talk, this article has some good stuff in that. Um, I've already showed you the preparing for, oh, this was, um, this was Susan Frederick Gray's article, press release that came out last week. And, um, and it's, you know, about sharing all of the, the information, that kind of thing. But it also talks about, um, you know, just doing things like washing your hands, um, you know, doing all of that. And, and, you know, how do we find our, how do we take care of that? One of the things that's been sort of gratifying, I've often been amused or amazed at how many people end up in a restroom where they never wash their hands before they leave. And since this has come up, I, every public restroom I've been in, no one has left without washing their hands. So that's that's a good thing. I'm just trying to figure out here what else I have up here. Um, um, the um, here's another one. There is uh, one of the other things on that list is too many of my icons look alike on the bottom of my screen for navigating. Um, this was a blog by the North Lake UU Church, who is the one that is in Kirkland. Um, and about what their experience was of going to virtual. So they had their minister in the chat, you know, went to the church, but nobody else did. Um, and, and that's where that, that great article on how to, um, on, uh, where is it? Uh, is it this one? Yes, this one is really good. Because when you look at, for example, the streaming, streaming to Facebook Live, it, um, it shows you, you know, here's what you need um, and the external battery and how you do this, you know, and you need somebody who is uh, watching for the online comments and someone else who is doing other things. So that, you know, it, it's just so helpful to be able to look at these resources and know you don't have to do it all yourself. Um, streaming to live tube. And again, they're working on the Zoom one that will be up here later. But here's what you do and, and what are some of the pros and cons. Um, you know, for YouTube, you can't stream from a mobile device um, unless you have a thousand subscribers. But um, you also can only use copyright material. So many of our, our services or our, our, you know, if you ha are doing music, um, 
what does that mean and how can you do that within copyright? And then another question is if you, um, if you archive this material, you know, can you archive copyrighted music, that kind of thing. So you might need to pay a little bit of attention to that as you're going through this. I think that those are all the, the sites that I had listed on that page. Um, so we have a little bit more time for other comments, questions. The way, oh, one thing that um, those of you who have watched last night's will talk about is that there was some concern expressed that what happens if my board doesn't want to go along with this and I think it's a good idea. And so one of the suggestions I made is that you would look to your, um, your policies around weather and when you close about weather and then ask the people what, the, what are the values that underline that policy. Why do we do this? What is the approach? And when you talk about those values, then you can say, and now how do we apply those values in this situation? Because most of those values will be around protecting your people, protecting your dear people. And so, uh, you know, how do we make sure we do that? And, and for me, it's not necessarily protecting the people who show up but it's protecting everybody else who will run into those people who show up. Um, you know, the, their, their older relatives, their neighbor down the block, their whomever, you know, and that kind of thing. Sally, I see you're unmuted. Did you want to chime in? Um, yeah, I was had heard something interesting on the radio this morning. Um, we were speaking with a woman from Italy where everybody has been quarantined for quite a long time. And they are putting in place ways of connecting people because of the extreme loneliness that people are experiencing being quarantined. And so I was just thinking you know, for us to be able to get our caring ministry into motion, to make phone calls, to you know, reach out that way. Um, obviously we can't do visits, but we can um, at least make contacts and spend a few minutes on the phone with someone one thing that we're looking at. That's great. And then you can also do things like FaceTime. If people have Apple devices, you know, there's all sorts of ways that you can connect. And, and just having a, a, you know, a coffee hour that's on Zoom where people can come and chit chat about whatever. Um, or you could even do some pro, you could, uh, if you're a congregation that does small group ministry, you could do a couple of one-off small group ministries so people know what they're like, you know, and do that online. And if you got 20 people and, and you're using a, a platform like Zoom, and I'm not trying to sell Zoom subscriptions, but I just know how much we use them, you can divide them into groups. So you can have, you know, 40 people show up, you can have four or five different groups. And so that they have that more intimate feel and that they can have those connections. Because yes, people are gonna be very lonely. And so how do we figure that out? One of the ministers I know is trying to figure out how do we have game night online? Um, now I'm not, you know, he said we can play card games and I'm trying to figure out, okay, so how do you do, you know, something like um, war or go fish when you might have two different decks of cards that are being operated and you could just have so much fun creating new rules and new ways of being that way. But yeah, that loneliness factor. And, and that's, I think, what draws a lot of our older people out because they don't have that interaction in their daily lives. Um, it's been, you know, one of the comments that one of the UUA staff made that is just, uh, of course, they, we use Microsoft products. So Microsoft Teams is one of the, the platforms where we can message back and forth. And so they set up a water cooler channel um, where people can just sort of have bizarre little water cooler kind of conversations. And, and one of the, you know, for us regional staff, we never are in the presence of anybody. So we're used to working alone. But one of the um, one of the staff from head office said, you know, it's been two days and I already have a volleyball named Wilson. Um, so for any of you who know that movie reference, so, you know, with Tom Hanks and Wilson, the volleyball who keeps him when he's uh, on a, a des desert island, you know, so, so w what's the way that we can, you know, create Wilsons for each other in the midst of all of this? Well, I think um, I, I really appreciate all those suggestions. I was just trying to think about how we stay in community, how community continues to 
to be important. Uh, you know, not only are we in the midst of our stewardship um, campaign, but uh, you know, we're going. Some of you have heard us heard me talk about um, we're going through a discussion about whether to change our Thomas Jefferson name and. It's rather divisive, as you can imagine, and so, um, you know, we need to remember why we're a community in the first place um, at this point, so uh, really appreciate all these. If anybody has anything to add, uh, I'd be grateful. That's really wonderful. Yeah, this is forcing us to rethink how we do community and how we do church. And I and I think that the lessons we learn in this are things that we can continue after. You know, so how do we have, uh, you know, some places have like minister with the lunch or min lunch with the minister, sorry, not minister with the lunch, but lunch with the minister. And everybody could be at home with their own sandwich, but through Zoom could still have those conversations or or whatever platforms, you know. So so a lot of, and, and you can add things like that. And, uh, you know, adding them temporarily doesn't, doesn't necessarily, um, mean that you have to do them forever, but you can do them for now. And, uh, you know, we're thinking, you know, in the Mid-America region, we might be able to do a lot more work this this next month because um, how much time it takes us to travel, you know, so how would we spend that time differently? So for some of your people, it might be shifting from getting, uh, you know, for religious educators, for getting all the supplies for Sunday morning or doing whatever, to being able to have these story times, um, you know, and, and you could even, um, Zoom does both a random breakout rooms or it also, you can assign people to rooms. So you could even have a, um, you start something where you have an older person meeting with a younger person to do reading tutoring or just reading together or things like that because you could have them all come in at the same time and then assign them to rooms in ways that uh, that allows that more intimate time so it's amazing the flexibility that's out if this had happened you know four years ago five years ago we wouldn't have any of these solutions and we'd be really struggling to find the ways but technology can really be our friend in this adventure Anything else at this point? I can always return you, you know, to your real lives, um, although this is a very big part of your real life right now, um, you know. Um, and I just want to clarify, is anybody concerned about um, about sharing this recording with a wider audience than, than our president's group? Again, you can always chat to me privately in the uh, chat if that's something that you would you know, like to do, but I, I think that you've shared great ideas and this conversation can help people figure out in their church. Sue. Um, I have no problem with it being shared. I'm quite sure our minister wouldn't either. Um, there's some great uh, tips and some, some really good conversation starters about our ethics and our, our privilege and how we approach this mm -hmm. problem. So I've appreciated it. Thanks. Yeah, I really worry about those people who don't get paid time off and those people who don't have access to medical care and how do we how do we do that kind of thing and you know what might we in our communities as we learn about situations like that do we want to band together with other nonprofits to figure out how we can help um, help people fund their lives if their jobs aren't in you know happening even this week, uh, a couple of days ago, my partner got uh, a letter from her our, one of our local banks. It was uh, the PNC branch. They reached out to all their customers and said, we understand this time might be financially challenging for you, and we're worried about you. And if you have any concerns, please be in touch with us because we want to help you figure out ways to be able to survive economically. And for a bank to Try, you know, yeah, they might be able to get some loans or, you know, but what I mean, you know, I, the, the sentiment in the letter was just so wonderful. I've not had any other banking institution reach out to me and say, hey, uh, you know, how can we help you in this time? And so if the bank can do it, I figure, you know, we should be able to do it as, uh, as Unitarian Universalist congregations as well. 
Uh, this is Martha. It's okay yep. with me to share this. I think um, I, I agree that the tips in it are great and the more we can share this information with others, the better. Great. All right. Thank you. Um, yeah, it, it, um, it's turning moral man and immoral society on its head. <laughs> I'm surprised. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to um, share as our closing reading, also from the same book. It's a poem by Anne Sexton called Courage. Because one of the things I'm just so mindful of is how you as leaders exhibit courage every day in the work that you do and how stepping up in this time requires a particular kind of it. It's in the small things we see it. The child's first step as awesome as an earthquake. The first time you rode a bike wallowing up the sidewalk. But the first spanking when your heart went on a journey all alone. When they called you crybaby or poor or fatty or crazy and made you into an alien, you drank their acid and concealed it. Later, if you faced the death of bombs and bullets, you did not do it with a banner. You did it with only a hat to cover your heart. You did not fondle the weakness inside you, though it was there. Your courage was a small coal that you kept swallowing. If your buddy saved you and died himself in doing so, then his courage was not courage. It was love, love as simple as shaving soap. Later, if you have endured a great despair, then you did it alone, getting a transfusion from the fire, picking the scabs off your heart, then wringing it out like a sock. Next, my kinsman, you powdered your sorrow, you gave it a back rub, and then you covered it with a blanket. And after it had slept a while, it woke to the wings of the roses and was transformed. Later, when you faced old age and its natural conclusion, your courage will still be shown in little ways. Each spring will be a sword you'll sharpen. Those you love will live in a fever of love, and you'll bargain with the calendar. And at the last moment, when death opens the back door, you'll put on your carpet slippers and stride out. And so again, just thank you so much for the courage and the commitment and what else you give up to be the leaders in your congregation, helping them in this difficult time, as well as all the other um, perhaps less dramatic or front page newsworthy times, but I know what it takes for you to do your jobs and I really appreciate it. So with that, have a good week and Martha, I'll look into uh, making sure that we have other ways for us to connect over the next week or so. Lisa, what was the uh, poetry book again, please? Poems to Live By in Anxious Times. Thank you. And uh, Joan Murray is the editor.